Welcome to the Cell and Gene Therapy Insights Expert Roundtable on the latest developments in immuno-oncology manufacturing, progress towards streamlined commercialization. I'm delighted to be joined by four leading experts today who will be sharing their experience and perspectives. And first, we have our guest moderator, Dr. Anthony Davies, founder and CEO of Dark Horse Consulting. He will be chatting with our three panelists today. Dr. Erstone Armelin, Director of R&D at Thermo Fisher Scientific, Knut Nies, Chief Technology Officer at Mustang Bio, and Dr. Sonja Mzonich, Vice President of Process Science and Manufacturing at Windmill Therapeutics. Well, thank you all very much indeed for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the roundtable. Let's begin today by discussing the current state of cell therapy cancer IO manufacturing and the issues that this field faces. I would like the panel to begin by framing the current drivers and challenges as they see them and discussing barriers to progress towards a desirable future state in each case. We will start with improving process control and the related subjects of characterization and the complexity of raw materials. Oystein, I'd like you to kick off this uh, first, please, and then afterwards I will invite the rest of the panel to join in. So let's start with just celebrating some of the success we have in, in the market. We have uh, seen a, a tremendous um, clinical success, which we all sort of base the future state on. Um, we see investments coming in. We see um, the cell and gene therapy really addressing unmet medical needs, and that's the core here to understand that we're actually targeting a new market. We are dealing with, uh, with severe cancer and still 35% of all cancer has poor prognosis. Some of the challenges that we see in, in the cell and gene therapy market is, is really linked to the fact that we have a very academic uh, manufacturing process more or less spread out in the whole marketplace. So the question will be how do we get from from this academic state and into the future state where we see more industrialization, more cost-effective uh, measures on, on the whole process. And this was, will be the big topic for today's discussion, how we actually are, are, are able to do that um, collectively in the marketplace. And there are a number of challenges, uh, including deeper characterization. Uh, a lot of the biology here is unknown. Uh, that gives a very difficult uh, starting point. Um, there are a number of other challenges like the supply chain, the cost, and even, even further out there is reimbursement challenges uh, to get this successfully into the marketplace. So this is some of the, the big, big uh, things we're discussing and we have seen success in some areas, but we're still lacking success in other areas. So the question is how do we get to the bigger markets which is really addressing the, the larger uh, chronic diseases like solid tumors. I agree, Oisin. Uh, these are in essence great problems to have because of the enormous tailwind of therapeutic efficacy that the field has been experiencing um, for the last few years. Um, Knut, as somebody who's actively involved in uh, developing some of these therapies for cancers which have poor prognosis with uh, even with conventional IO and certainly with conventional cancer therapies. Uh, would you like to add your perspective? So yeah, I definitely uh, would second what Oisin said. Um, we, we really kind of developing a new field. We, we see some movements, you know, Oisin mentioned reimbursement as an issue that's being developed um, and there's talked about. The one thing I would point out that it's really not talked enough uh, in, in my view is what I would call workforce development. So we, we have a lot of successes now in terms of um, you know, clinical efficacy. We see a lot of therapies, not just in cell therapy, also in gene therapy, uh, really come to fruition, a lot of companies springing up. Um, but what, what one problem is we face certainly is um, you know, having a workforce. So especially in, in uh, the um, areas of regulatory quality control, quality assurance, even business development, I would say. So I think we need to start focusing a little bit of how can we work with universities and colleges together to really uh, provide the um, education to a workforce that will uh, help us for the years to come. That's a very interesting comment, Knud, and I think it's one which is often overlooked. 
Sanyan, you come from a unique perspective uh, on this panel, having worked, if you will, from a manufacturing perspective on both sides of the fence. You've had a long and very successful career in the contract manufacturing industry, and now you too are at a company which is developing therapeutics. Uh, perhaps you could start by following on from Knut's comment about workforce development in, in the context of both of those environments that you have experience in. I was actually going to mention the same thing that Knut brought up. For me, when I was on the CMO side of the business, one of the biggest challenges or barriers to growing the business itself was actually workforce development and talent development. Uh, as I have transitioned onto the sponsor side, let's call it from that perspective, the challenge remains. Obviously, it comes from a different angle, but the challenge is definitely there. I, I think, in essence, the primary focus as I'm looking right now as a leader of at Windmill on how to grow and develop our company is really to focus on workforce development and to take us to that, that next level, because that's the only way to truly ensure scalability. The other point I would add to Oystein and Knut that they brought up is, and this will probably come up later in our conversation, is the entire transition of our overall field from these bespoke medical treatment, academic background type processes and procedures to actually us as a field coming together and starting to develop true technological platforms and procedural platforms that can make the workforce development more universally applicable, but also the field itself more universal and therefore help us drive costs down. Even right now, if we bring that back to workforce development as an example, if each organization is developing its workforce to meet its unique need, that's not true scalability. That's really just plugging temporarily the holes in our system before moving forward. So to me, that's as we look how to move forward, it's really moving from bespoke to more universal things. And by universal, I don't mean universal products, but more approaches and platforms to manufacturing and controls. Very interesting, Sanyin. I think today uh, we are going to focus on a lot on issues such as characterization and process control. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my experience, this has been a key area where skills are lacking. Um, I think improving the depth of characterization with robust analytical methods uh, is one of the central issues we are facing. And the drive towards better tools and more standardized manufacturing. Uh, obviously, Thermo is contributing significantly to this field, but I'd like to ask Knut to kick off on this subject of the, the improving the depth of characterization uh, with robust methods. Yeah, I think you know you, you point out a really important thing because in the over the past few years we always focus on the processing side, you know, talking about which process technologies uh, are working well to date, which one, where are the gaps, and what we need to do improve on. But we really didn't talk much about the analytical side, and I think it's a it's a mistake. We really need to uh, focus on that, especially when it comes to uh, ultimately to the QC release of products. Right now, all the assays that are used are very, what I would call academic assays, low throughput, fairly hands-on, if you think about tax profiling, PCR, etc. So there's certainly room for a certain degree of automation, certain degree of, of high throughput. I would say that in, in order to improve all this, uh, also on the processing side, I think we need to to share more among uh, um, among various companies, so to speak. We've always been traditionally reluctant to talk about our little trade secrets, how we do things in the processing step, when ultimately it turns out we're all doing the same thing. And um, what is, is really missing in my view, or what we can improve upon is letting vendors like Thermo Fisher, Millipore, et cetera, know where the gaps are and how they can help moving the field of, in, along. So I'll give you an example. We, we here at Mustang Bio, for our next phase, we determined that having incubators in the clean room space is a waste of space. Um, and we really would like to take the incubators out. So we're developing our, uh, our own incubator prototype uh, com together with an engineering company. But we purposely don't make that a proprietary thing. We actually uh, won't have IP around that and leave it open because we feel that if that if the incubator is a successful technology, we really want others to use, utilize it as well. Sanyan, perhaps you'd like to comment on that, particularly from your CMO experience. Did you feel that you were being asked to tech transfer and execute assays 
from potentially academic sources uh, which were less well developed than you liked in order to put them into an industrialized environment? I didn't see that from a CMO perspective as a challenge. There was an opportunity to provide value to the sponsors that were working with us. But as a general rule, when I even look at our field, clinically we are far more advanced than we are when it actually comes to CMC development and especially late stage commercial type development. So in most cases on the CMO side, we would get a lot of customers or sponsors whose analytical development, while appropriate for what they were working, or let's say the stage of the trials that was supporting was not necessarily set up as a platform for late stage development in the future to allow them to go into commercial stage. So it was always a question in essence, trying to balance out the immediate needs, meaning proceed expeditiously to the next stage trial with actually maybe taking a little bit longer to reposition those assays in a CMO environment to actually allow you not only the ability to move on to your next stage trial, but to create that platform that allows you to actually fully develop them and validate them for commercial use. Oystein, this must be viewed as a tremendous challenge, but a tremendous opportunity for companies such as Thermo. Uh, the more you can package up analytical methods into off the shelf useful forms for this industry, uh, this must be a tremendous opportunity. Uh, but the novel nature of the therapeutics and their complexities make it a very hard challenge. <clears throat> I think I think um, I think there's one element that really is not really discussed enough, and that is the underlying biology of the drug. And it's uh, it's not easy because we are learning, <clears throat> we're unravel some of the potential of understanding the drug, and from that perspective, understand the process. So I think that the complexity here is really, uh, you know, how, how are we finding the, the most uh, critical quality attributes to control them? I think that's still a discussion. And, <clears throat> and I think I like Knut's comment here because one of the things here is the secret uh, nature of, of each and one's process. We would like to, everyone would like to pr protect their own uh, knowledge base. And that's kind of a, um, a drawback from making true progress. It's hard for a company like uh, Termo to really understand what the, the general themes are out there. It, it's basically hard because there's lack of communication, lack of openness. I think even, uh, even long-standing issues such as CMO management and tech transfer are often now crystallizing into, uh, into comparability challenges. Um, Sanya, now, now you're on the other side of the fence. Um, could you describe your experiences in, in, in relationship management from the CMO and the client side, perhaps now moving um, a little bit away from the technical aspects we've discussed into the more uh, interpersonal and uh, interactions between, between corporations uh, aspect of this challenge? Absolutely. So in essence, CMOs, I believe, and I'll say that I'm somewhat biased given my background, are still a very vital part of our entire ecosystem and will become, in my opinion, even more important as we mature as a field. Going for, I, I feel that every sponsor entering into a CMO relationship, it starts with an introspective look to see actually what are you truly looking to get from a CMO and then proceeding into a selection pro process that allows you to find the right partner for you. And, you know, from my experience, I would say that mostly given that these searches start off on a very technical side of the sponsor business, uh, CMOs are often solely and very focusedly evaluated based on kind of check on the paper technical competencies without actually looking into how those technical competencies are both going to be applied towards your own work and how they're going to be managed and integrated into the overall business of your company. So the CMO should, in my opinion, not be viewed as a transactional entity, but more as a true collaborative partner. And in a lot of ways, there, there's often not a very distinct or purposeful attempt to set up collaborations and maintain them, because there's a lot of give and take to be a truly collaborative with another party. Um, to your point about uh, 
comparability becoming an issue here as well. That's again something that I would say is, you know, comparability is not a CMO specific issue. It's just an issue of in general scale out expansion and growth of any business as you move from from one manufacturing site to multiple manufacturing sites. And again, I would say that it's a mistake to think of comparability as something that just kind of organically shakes out out of everything else. It's something that actually needs to be very thoughtfully and intentionally managed from the beginning. So part of the CMO relationship and competency evaluation is actually for you as a sponsor to ask yourself at the end of this journey of let's say tech transfer to a CMO or another manufacturing site, how are you going to establish comparability? What are you actually measuring? How are you measuring it? And what are the capabilities necessary to achieve that? And use that as the framework through which you a evaluate and engage your partners, and then drive the collaboration with. Thank you, Sandin. Very interesting. And I, there are no people currently working at CMOs on this call today, so I, I can say from, from an unbiased perspective, uh, I referenced a recent quote from Bloomberg, where the chief executive of a cell and gene therapy company uh, recently stated that in the in the next 24 months, they, they feel they will need to build more manufacturing capacity uh, than all of the existing capacity in the world today. You know, this is simply not possible, uh, and it's not certainly not possible for early stage companies. So I think for better or worse, uh, like in every field in medicine, uh, the, the rumors of the death of CMOs have been uh, greatly exaggerated. Let's move on now to the idea of simplifying manufacturing. Simplifying manufacturing will benefit everybody. It will make it faster, it will make it cheaper, and it will make it easier to tech transfer, which will also make it cheaper. I'd like to start off by talking about uh, automation. There are really two schools of thought at the moment. Uh, automate everything, GMP in a box, uh, obviously, one of, the, uh, one of the giants in this field is Miltony with the Prodigy device, uh, the all-in-one solution, uh, versus focused automation of specific uh, key unit operations. I refer to this as the Build-A-Bear approach, where you take a, something from here, something from there, something from somewhere else, uh, and you bolt it all together with a nice IT system. I think preeminent in that field, I would single out GE Healthcare, which is really trying hard uh, to do this. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'll start with Knud because I know he has interesting thoughts in this field, but I'm going to ask each of you, uh, what are the pros and cons of each approach? The GMP in a box approach versus the build bear approach uh, for each of you. Um, and what do you think uh, the future holds? Knud, uh, kick us off here. Yeah, sure. So right up front, I would say I'm a build bear kind of guy. Um, I don't believe in the GMP in the box concept much. Um, for several reasons. So one is, uh, if you do a GMP in the box, like the Prodigy device, for example, you basically put your entire process into the hand of one vendor. I'm not sure that's really where you want to be uh, long term. Uh, but more importantly, and you know, I should say here at Mustang, we do use um, a, a GMP in the box device, not for the entire process. We only use it for certain processing steps. Um, but what the issues we're running in sometimes are, you know, you, you get a software update that's corrupt. You get a, a you know, a, a machine that's not 100% functional. So in other words, uh, we keep expo experiencing quite high failure rates. And that is, to me alone, is a reason to think about not putting your entire process into one uh, piece of equipment, um, simply because if you experience a failure mode, um, your entire process is going down. Now, if you do a modular approach, the Build-A-Bear approach, um, you have the opportunity to eventually double, double on every process step. So if you use device X uh, in your processing, you can spec in a uh, device Y in case device X is not working. So for, for process robustness, I, I honestly believe that the Build-A-Bear approach, which I, I like that phrase, um, because it, it really uh, puts it down nicely what it means. It's, it's the right approach, so that's my take. That's very interesting. I think, uh, I think you are 100% aligned with about half of the community. Yes. So uh, let's move on to, uh, to Sanyan next in this context. You've seen it all. I know that you have had to respond uh, to both approaches in your CMO days. 
Uh, and now uh, I'm interested to hear how you feel about it out, uh, out on the other side of the table. Well, I would say overall, again, it's situational. So you have to first assess what do you need in order you know, to go on the right path. I would say overall, I would start with a Build-A-Bear approach like Newt for the exact same reasons. It, to me, it's a great risk mitigation strategy. And also as somebody who has come into this field as a true biologist, you know, the entire aspect of evolution, you know, if, if things are still individual, if all the process steps are individually controlled, I think it allows you, especially during development phase of your product and process to really respond to challenges and, you know, everything that can go wrong will go wrong during development. So in a modular approach, you can respond to it much more flexibly and continue to evolve your process based on the needs. Uh, I would say there is a time and a place for GMP in a box. I personally would take that approach once through my build a bear approach. I have really defined my design space, my parameters really gotten good control of the system and its needs. Then in order to you know, make it more efficient, less costly, all of those pros of the GMP in a box system, I would create a GMP in a box version of my process, but I would keep the blueprint in a very modular way to continue to evolve as a platform for my core technology. I think we at Dark Horse have seen both work well. The GMP in a box, uh, again, not to single out Miltony, but the GMP in a box prodigy type approach tends to work best when for whatever reason, one of our clients makes an early strong commitment to it. And then if you will, their process grows in the box. It grows in that particular ecosystem. And the build of our approach, we see, we often see that working better for uh, products which come out of academia later. So the product has had a chance to evolve outside of the box, if you will. Uh, but I think either, you know, I've seen either uh, both systems are something that you that will have to be supported. Uh, I'm interested to hear as somebody sort of sitting on the sideline of that issue, uh, how you feel about it. Well, <clears throat> I think there's a timing element to this. Um, at this point in time, I, I do feel that unit operation is the way to go. There, there, there are still a lot of technologies and, and things that will happen um, in, in different part of the, the process. And in order to, to really optimize and improve certain part of the process, I do believe that the way to go right now is to do a unit operation type approach. Um, we don't know, you know, we did an exercise of, you know, some time back and, and tried to go back in time to, to look into where we are today. And we, we, we couldn't, we couldn't, you know, we, we were wrong, right? Five years ago. So f five years ahead of us, would we predict where we are? I'm not sure because the, the, the rapid evolution of this market is, is going to take us places we don't know today. So I think we need to, to keep an, an, a very flexible approach and in order to test out new te technologies in certain parts of the workflow. I think that will come into a stronger play when we go into solid tumors, which we don't know because a lot of the thought process that we have today is based on what we have learned in the blood related cancers when we are moving into a whole different territory, we will rapidly know other things and we will start to see things differently. So I think we need to keep a, a flexibility in order to, to be able to advance the field as we see new technologies come into play in certain area of the, of the workflow. I, I agree completely. And uh, just perhaps as a final comment on, on that question, uh, perhaps one of the greatest compliments that Miltony has been paid is that there are now competing devices uh, emerging in their space. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's an indication that uh, both sides are viable and will be here to stay. Anthony, if I can make one more comment to this question, because I think it's important to remember that if you go with a GMP in a box, obviously you start that in early development, but you really need to think about life cycle management of your asset, because ultimately if you end up in a in an all-inclusive device, you want to understand what the commercial impact is, right? Um, what is the license fee? What, what are the, the technology fees that you will have to pay? And you don't want to go through all of clinical development just to learn that, you know, half your revenue is going somewhere else. So 
well. Completely agree. Uh, but I would also add that, that that applies to every unit operation in the build aware approach. So you might argue that there you've compounded that same problem. Right, except that's why I said in the build a bear approach, you can ultimately spec in other devices as an alternative. Yes, absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Thank you. Knut? Yeah, and I would also say that the build a bear approach, I think, leads us as a field away from the bespoke nature of our manufacturing, which we have talked about at the beginning, is kind of one of the root causes of the scalability and cost challenges that we're facing as a community and as a field in general. When we go GMP in a box, especially at the very beginning, it has to, by just definition, be very bespoke versus when we're working at a unit operation process, we can, as a field, share those unit operations while still, for the purpose of our own IP development and protection, protect, let's say, a very specific utilization of those unit operation platforms, but then the ecosystem like device manufacturers and CMOs can still have a universal palette or libraries of those unit operation technological competencies that can allow them to, in a more effective and flexible way, serve the entire environment we're working in. It will be super interesting to revisit this question in perhaps two and five years from now uh, and see whether we're giving different answers. Uh, I'd like to shift topics again now. Uh, a key element supporting renewed optimism for allergenic approaches, uh, although not exclusively allergenic approaches, in I.O. Um, is the rise of gene editing. Gene editing has been developed for many different purposes, and it is now possible that it can be used uh, to either make cells slippery to the immune system and evade adverse immunosurveillance, uh, or to edit cells so that they can better engage with the immune system perhaps of non-matched or only half-matched uh, recipient patients. The switch to allo uh, from uh, auto is obviously uh, somewhat of a holy grail. I don't think anybody seriously wants to debate auto versus allo anymore. Uh, I think people genuinely believe that both are going to have contributions um, to the field. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to start with Oystein and uh, talk about the economics of allo, and uh, if you would like to comment further on gene editing's impact on this, uh, that would also be very interesting. And then I'll move out to the rest of the panel again. Yeah, I, I think we're at the very, very early stage of, of that transition into an allo space. And one of the things that I think the, the, the market struggle with now is to use healthy donors, right? Healthy donors will take us a certain way uh, it will provide a little bit of better economics. Um, I think we now start to see more of the endpoint coming into play, uh, which is a, a more salon based approach where you, you really can talk about scale and really start to talk about economics. Um, it's going to be a rough road because there's so many things you need to control. You need to have high efficiencies. You need to control the safety aspects of allo. Uh, it's going to be quite a journey. And particularly if you want to advance your uh, program in a clinical, set, uh, clinical setting, it's going to be challenging because of the technology is very early. Um, there's many things you need to manage on a safety aspect before we see a broad use in the clinic. I, I, you know, I think it's going to take some time and I'm very much in favor of find the right balance between allo and auto because of, simply because of the nature of understanding the biology of the drug. So I think, I think it's going to be an important contribution, but I do think it's going to be, take a lot of time and energy to get this into a commercial setting. I couldn't agree more. I know that you and I were modeling the economics of allo cell process unit operations over 10 years ago. Uh, and those were tough discussions and tough calculations. And that was before the uh, autologous clinical tailwind, uh, which we've experienced uh, since then. Knut, would you, like to, uh, would you like to add to this next? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, to me, it's, it's all about clinical efficacy and safety. And, you know, and then part of the allo auto discussion is, of course, the, the 
reimbursement slash price tag. So, you know, not talking too much about the safety, like I think that uh, will bear out in clinical development trials, uh, people will start managing them. But ultimately, if you look at the cost of goods of an allotherapy, I'm not convinced yet that it's so much cheaper than an autologous. Uh, and the reason for it is uh, you have uh, significant more processing steps, the gene editing. But besides the gene editing, you also have to have a mechanism of sorting out the non-edited cell. Uh, so you, you're adding pretty significant processing steps that are not cheap to do. And then, of course, uh, it, it correlates to how many cells do you need for a dose, which ultimately gives you how many doses you get out of an allo run. So I haven't seen really convincing data that tell me that the allo approach will be you know, one tenth of an autologous approach. So, for me, if you fact, if you look at the manufacturing side, the QC release, all these, I think the the Allo has a way to go to show that it's really significantly cheaper. And by by not let's put it this way, by not being significantly cheaper, then the question becomes, why would you prefer Allo over Auto? And for example, in the CAR T approach, if it's if it's roughly in the same ballpark of the price, I. Personally, I would always go as an autologous because I know it's safe. Uh, I think those are very interesting comments, and we 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 have done some similar analyses. Another problem with aloe medicine is the donors. Um, the aloe products that uh, Oystein and I were working on ten years ago uh, were embryonic stem cell products, and you could genuinely see lot sizes in the thousands or even the tens of thousands, uh, almost regardless of those, due to the infinite proliferation potential for that modality. Uh, but in, for example, T-cell products, uh, very few donors give you the best yields, and uh, many donors do not. And you end up in some ways with the, the worst of all worlds, because you are moving from donor to donor, you're pseudo-allogeneic, um, and as you say, that the cost of goods uh, has a high bar to reach before you combat the um, combating the problems of the human immune system. However, you know, with gene editing, um, I think, and with other methods, I think people will continue to push at this, and uh, we will see some allogeneic products. Uh, I, I, again, I feel it's not no longer a productive debate to talk about either or auto or allo. Uh, I think it will be both. Uh, we'll see in what uh, proportion. Sanyan, you, you've worked on both. Uh, what do you think? From my perspective, I agree with everything you guys have said, especially about this, what I call allo-ish products that we have right now, because ultimately for me, allo is the future, but the future might be much further away than what in general we're thinking about. I would say for me, the key issue to resolve actually for allo futures is donor situation. We have to actually not think in terms of donors, but in terms of lines. You know, once we get to a point where we have established lines so that the source material is actually truly allo, only then can we think about the downstream applications of various gene editing technologies and things like those to uh, give us both the safety profiles and the cost needs in order to make this commercially viable. In essence, if we have to over-engineer downstream to really take care of the upstream variability, even in what today we're talking about, allo, you know, multiple donors for more lots than one, I, I at the end of the day, I agree with Newt. If I had a choice, I would much rather go with an auto product just out of concern for safety and efficacy in a patient. And if you also look at now the, you know, kind of how the reimbursement is working, you know, Kim Raya, a couple of other uh, drugs that are now commercial, they are actually performance-based reimbursement. So in essence, even if you have an allo, what we think of right now product that might start off at a lower price tag, but it's not as efficacious, the company developing it will not actually get as much reimbursement out of it. If they go down the efficacy-based reimbursement, then something that as an auto product may start off more expensive in the current technology landscape, but actually have the efficacy and safety profile to earn its full reimbursement. I think the, I always ask myself as somebody working on auto therapy, do I resolve the issue of cost of goods by going out or do I resolve it through technology to making my auto better and more lean? And I'm kind of 
moving more towards the latter than the former in that case. Very interesting. I think both are, both are great approaches. Um, Oystein, I'd like to ask you about Thermo's opinions uh, on safety, as Sanyin raised the issue of the safety profile. Uh, and I'm interested in your thoughts on um, the safety profile of these products and the tests which will assure that safety. Yeah, I, I think this goes back to, to what uh, several has said on this call. It's, it's going to be, you know, it, you increase the complexity because you need to effectively manage um, um, genes and how they are um, uh, transcribed. So it's, it's going to be important to, uh, to remove all the impurities that each process will generate. There will be uh, cells that escape the, uh, the CRISPR or the talent technology and they need to be removed and they need to be removed effectively. So it's going to be quite an exercise to, uh, to both have technologies that correctively do what you need to do with the genes, but at the same time ensure that you have a safe product at the end of your manufacturing process. This goes back to the work we did with uh, embryonic stem cells. It's quite the same. You need to, you know, you need to really handle the impurities, and that's that's not a small issue either. So uh, that will trigger new assays, new new um, new detection, new in process controls. Um, the complexity and the risk will increase. Um, so your daily manufacturing will be far more complex than today, which is complex enough. It's an opportunity for for companies like the one I represent for sure. So we're to play, uh, we're happy, we're ready with technologies and we can help, but we do see that risk is increasing here and that needs to be managed. Thank you, Austin, super interesting. Uh, I'd like to move on now to one of the elephants in the room, um, which is manufacturing capacity. Uh, both auto, allo, in a box, build a bear, uh, perhaps today uh, it's most publicly manifested by issues in viral vector supply um, impacting the IO field uh, as well as the pure play gene therapy field. Um, I'm very interested to hear what the panel makes of recent trends in this regard. Uh, Oystein, uh, your company has just uh, splashed the cash in the, in the CMO field, uh, made a very impactful uh, acquisition. Uh, but actually only one of two acquisitions of that uh, enormous size this year. Uh, would you kick this discussion off, the capacity discussion? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the typical footprint of uh, an emerging area like the cell and gene therapy is really around technologies and, and um, production uh, capacity. And typically... In, in emerging markets, you see a lot of small players move in uh, with uh, niche technologies. The technologies that these companies have is, is often good, but the challenge for them is to really increase their capacity, have, have a, you know, investment dollars to drive both technology advancement as well as uh, advancement in, in, in manufacturing and quality. So it's only natural, I think, that uh, the larger players start to react when they see um, the market uh, mature. Um, and I think it's also an opportunity for the larger companies to not only come in with their capacity, which is often in place, but also to leverage some of the technologies that are important um, to optimize um, new technologies like vector production. It's many, many technologies required for an optimal and effective manufacturing, which then needs to be scaled. So many challenges. And I think it's, it's where the, the bigger companies actually can help advance the field more rapidly. So it's only a natural thing. It's a natural evolution of this market. And it's a good sign because it means that the market is getting more mature. I think it is a good sign. Knut, you've come out largely on one side of this debate in terms of uh, outsource versus insource. Yeah, we basically have decided to build our own manufacturing facility uh, based on the assessment that with multiple programs, 
uh, it becomes eventually more cost effective. Um, but really what I, what I would point out is I think one problem capacity wise we have these days is that you know, there's a lot of facilities that are large and so on and there's a strong belief that you need a large footprint to do uh, these, these kind of um, products. When I really look at, when you look at these facilities, they, they look very much like biologics facilities, right? So the, the clean rooms, the infrastructure is really geared towards uh, what I would call biologics or I'll call it alum manufacturing. But really the way we look at it is um, if you design the facility around your process, um, you actually get more capacity out of the smaller footprint and that ultimately translates to cost reductions. So what I mean by that is, you know, we look process unit by process unit um, and realize there are process units like, for example, the lentiviral transduction that are very, very short, very, uh, they, they require a small footprint. So the clean room for that unit operation will be very small compared to a fill finish room, for example. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we're looking at, for example, an incubator that we don't put in the clean room, but put it, put it outside in the clean, clean room space, but not in the in the designated clean room and by that way can separate products. Uh, that's where we as, assess that we get to a high capacity and high capacity ultimately is then uh, lower cost. So I think going forward, I think smart facility design, as I would call it, is, is one way of reducing the cost dramatically. All the way through commercial? All the way through commercial. So, um, you know, to give you an example, we, we occupy a 28,000 square foot facility we estimate that at, at the uh, full build out, we will be able to do three, 4,000 processes a, a year here. And if you compare that to what, what some companies publicly stated, uh, that's very similar, except their facilities are multiple of, of the square foot. Tony, and does that make you happy or out of the CMO business? <laughs> Maybe, as I said, I always look at what people perceive as challenges, as opportunities to create and develop new responses to it, you know, I, I would almost rephrase the statement that there's a lack of or shortage of manufacturing capacity to say that there, in, I would say that the current availability of manufacturing capacity in the field is not a small footprint or not sufficiently large footprint of universally applicable capabilities and capacities, but it's actually rather too big smorgasbord or a mosaic of loosely related pockets of capability. So I think what Canu just said really kind of dovetails into the comment I really wanted to drive home here is that, you know, what we again have to do as a field is in this theme of standardization when every when all the facilities are organized in a way that universally fits everybody, you get the efficiency that Canute was talking about versus, you know, I'll I'll speak from my previous role and experience, you know, in my portfolio at one time I had 12 customers who were basically doing 99% identical thing, but everybody was doing it in a completely different way. So of course there's shortage in manufacturing capacity because you have to reinvent the wheel for every car that comes into your garage and that just, it's not a platform for success of a field in general. So I think it, it, it's not just a matter of size. It's, it's not a quantitative question. To me, it's actually more of a qualitative question. What, what's the landscape like in a manufacturing field? This has been a great discussion. Um, it's time to wrap up now. My final question for each panelist is that if you could wave a magic wand and conjure up a single solution to any of the issues we've discussed today uh, that either stand in the way of simplified cost-effective uh, future manufacturing or stand in the way of something which is already good and cost-effective and simple but could be much better, uh, what would you, what would you, what magic would you create by waving your magic wand? Um, Knut, perhaps you could uh, share your thoughts first. Yeah, sure. So um, I think on, you know, my wand would not go to the processing side. It goes actually to the QC side. Uh, I think if, if I could have my wish, I would have a fully automated fax and PCR technology. But because that's where in QC we spend a lot of time, operator time, again, which translates to cost. At Mustang, you, you do a lot of things yourself. Would you consider this as an in-house project? Um, I'm not sure we have the bandwidth. So first of all, yeah, we do everything ourselves. So again, we, we process ourselves and we do a full QC release here. Um, I'm not sure at this point we have the bandwidth to really develop technologies like that. 
I mean, I'm, to be honest, I'm looking at technologies out there that already exist. Like um, I forgot the name of the company that does the CD34 uh, fax standard assay, where you basically put your sample in, similar to like cell counting almost, you know, incubate and then it gets automatically read. So that should be expandable technology to CD3s and, and, and beyond, because ultimately, uh, you know, especially in the CAR-T setting, the assays are very similar. Um, and again, uh, PCR is, is another one that's fairly hand-on. Obviously, PCR, you get more throughput, um, but it's still very hands-on operator time. Oystein, if you're allowed one wave of the wand, what will it be? Yeah, all right. So it has to be future-oriented. Um, since I'm wearing an R&D hat today, I, I have to go for the solid tumor space. That means that there's a, I see that there is a, an opportunity to, uh, to generate T cells regardless of donor, uh, status of the donor that has the opportunity to be effective in solid tumor environment. That means that the, the T cells need to be trained for an enormously complex and hostile environment. This will require multiple technologies put together. Um, we see now that that might be possible and that's my passion to make sure that that happens. Sanian, anything to add from your perspective in the wish list? Now, I would again expand. I think Knut and I are on the same wavelength today. For me, the focus is actually more on quality control and I'll put a different spin on it from a characterization perspective. I, I do think the if we can enhance the ways by which we can characterize what does the, let's say, the phenotype of the cells, how does it actually uh, align with their functionality, a broader range of functional assays that replicate biological processes that are underlying the mechanism of action. I think by having that greater understanding at early stages of trials would help us then in the future drive automation, drive manufacturing efficiency, facility design, everything stems from understanding your product. So uh, right now, you know, with Windmill, I'm lucky enough to step into my role early on in our uh, portfolio development stage. And I'm really focusing on actually getting the, the best understanding of our product. And we're already facing challenges from that perspective. There's just not enough. You know, looking at CD markers, to me, it's not sufficient to actually describe a very complex biology of a, especially in the case of a solid tumor of a T cell and a solid tumor interaction environment and how to manipulate it to our needs. I'd like to thank each member of the panel for their contributions today. This has been a very interesting discussion. Uh, it's a subject we will come back to uh, on many occasions in the future, but thank you to the panel and thank you to BioInsights for uh, convening this meeting. It's been very interesting and I hope all of the people watching it uh, find it as interesting as we have.